Hey guys, this is your High Fist here with another juicy topic for you guys. As always, thank you to Steven Erickson for sharing and almost commenting on my last video, the one on uh, religion and losing faith. And thank you to my friend Ishka Jarak for agreeing to upload our Mother's Day discussion on my channel. That was a lot of fun as usual. So we have something different today, guys. A bit crazy, but a bit different as well. As most of you know, your high fist doesn't like the spoiler-free stuff. I'm far more comfortable with post-series discussions where I touch on broader themes in all 10 books. But as you also know, I like these longer collections like trilogies. We've done a trilogy on sexual violence in the Malazan Book of the Fallen series. We've done a trilogy on military strategy in the 10 big books. So I like the idea of longer goals that require multiple videos. And of course, you guys know that Quick Ben is my absolute favorite character in the entire series. Even though Bauklein is my favorite Steven Erickson creation, as far as the 10 big books go, I think most of my subscribers know Quick Ben is number one for me. Quick Ben's my guy, right? So call me crazy, guys, but this is what I'm doing. I am creating a certification course on QuickBen, a free course after which you will be a Rutenbad certified QuickBen expert. A series of lectures on every QuickBen scene in the 10 big books. You heard that right. Every QuickBen scene in the 10 big books. We will be dissecting them analyzing them we will look at why he's a great character how steven erickson uses him in the plot the narrative layers surrounding him the way he outwits his opponents his impressive use of magic blah 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 right you get the gist so this is what i'm planning the course structure to be like what you're watching now is the introductory lecture lecture one where i just outlined some of my preliminary spoiler free thoughts on the quick ben character and give you some information on the course itself which is what i've been doing so far and in the next couple of weeks i will hopefully keep uploading where we go book by book chronologically so if you've only read gardens of the moon then perhaps it's just the first lecture or two that would be relevant to you if you're on something like let's say the bone hunters then you can stop watching once we get to that point. I think you get the gist, right? So we keep analyzing each scene chronologically until we get to the last quick bend scene. Think of it as a Malazan read along or a reread, but it's a deep dive solely on quick bend instead of the overall series. And based on the response, we might even do a few sort of uh, post series discussion videos after that so if you're someone who hasn't finished the series i will try to make quick bend story a little clearer for you because there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense in your first read through that will make sense if somebody just gives you some context which nobody does when you sort of go through your first read through but it doesn't have to be that confusing and for those of you who like to jot down details and take notes and keep track of things as you read along. I will also be pointing out the passages and scenes that you have to pay close attention to as you keep reading the series. Once you complete this prestigious certification course, you can call yourself a quick Ben expert. If you're at a job interview and you're asked about the warrants he can use, you have the answer at your fingertips. If you ever get mugged and your assailant happens to be a huge quick Ben fan, you can de-escalate the situation. Or if you're just sort of, you know, looking to make a, a living in the lucrative quick Ben industry, this course will be life changing for you, right? Because I am the Thomas Edison of the quick Ben industry. Ericsson, Ericsson's just Tesla, right? While I am Edison. And since this course is completely free, you also have a money back guarantee if you're not satisfied with the the quality of the faculty of the one-man faculty 
right? So with all that said, let's get this series of lectures started. Spoiler-free thoughts on Quick Ben. He is one of the top fan favorites in the Malazan fandom. You actually don't get too much discussion about him in the sort of academic, intellectual discussions about the series, the way that you might with uh, Tavor or Felicin or Anamanda Rake or maybe even Kasa Olong because these are all characters who are used to explore thematic and emotional issues. While with Quick Ben, it's a lot more about fun. He's an extremely fun, entertaining character to read. Not only is he a character who likes to have fun himself, he's always up to mischief. He's always scheming. He's always doing things his own way. Always poking his nose where he shouldn't. And almost always getting away with it. He's a, he's a maverick. He's a troublemaker. He's a scholar. And he's a total badass which is why I love him. He is the quintessential trickster mage archetype that we regularly see in fantasy fiction. Quick Ben is John Constantine. Quick Ben is Harry Dresden. Quick Ben is uh, Mandrake the Magician, right? If you know who that is. So we have seen this trope, this archetype recurring over and over again in fantasy fiction. And yet it's also a trope which shows us that not all archetypes have to be reinvented over and over again. As long as you understand how these characters can be made compelling, you can make them compelling. Erickson usually, usually thrives in creating subversive characters who challenge our misconceptions and assumptions as readers and who challenge their own tropes as well. But Quick Ben isn't really like that. Quick Ben, as I was saying, he's not so much a subversive character as he is just a really entertaining and mysterious character in the old-fashioned way. Uh, he's a great example for why a character doesn't have to be subversive to be interesting. It just seems like these days many writers simply assume that they've got to reinvent the wheel over and over again and that everything's got to be a subversion, everything's got to be a a critique of the system. Everything's got to be some overcomplicated, oh, but I actually meant this. I was actually trying to deconstruct this. That kind of nonsense. But with Quick Ben, thankfully, we don't get that. I mentioned John Constantine a little while ago, and I think the comparison is interesting, particularly because John Constantine is also one of my favorite uh, fictional characters. Not the shitty movie version, right? The ones we see in the actual Hellblazer comic book run. John Constantine was created by one of the greatest storytellers of the 20th century, Alan Moore, who obviously wrote uh, Watchmen, V for Vendetta, uh, From Hell, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, right? Uh, many, many what I would consider to be graphic novel masterpieces, which have unfortunately not been given the TV or movie adaptations that they deserve. Even the good ones are not as good as Alan Moore's uh, source material. So he's a, he's a genius and he was the one who created John Constantine. The other writer who had a major impact on the John Constantine character is Garth Ennis, who is also an incredible comic book writer. He was responsible for making the Punisher famous again with the Punisher Max run. He wrote uh, Preacher, which is a very, very famous uh, comic book series run, one of my favorites. Uh, uh, he, he, he wrote The Boys, which I understand is a live action, has a live action adaptation now. And I think I've even heard Erickson mention that he really liked it because it was subversive. So that's always been a trademark of Garth Ennis's work. So John Constantine was created by Alan Moore and Garth Ennis and Quick Ben was created by Steven Erickson. And these are both great examples of mage archetypes who are interesting simply because they're interesting, not because the writers were trying to, as I was saying, reinvent the wheel while, while doing it. If you're, if you're a John Constantine fan, you will be a Quick Ben fan and vice versa. Let's look at Quick Ben himself, right? Let's look at some of the defining features. Why do I call him a 
trickster mage archetype. He's extremely powerful in terms of his magical abilities, but his it's his capacity to think outside the box that which serves as his real weapon. He's the master of magic, yes, but it's the inventive and creative ways in which he applies his mastery of magic which makes the character special. He's an extremely quick thinker. The reason he's called Quick Ben isn't because he's physically swift, it's because he's mentally quick. He's regarded with total suspicion even by his own friends and rightfully so. And the most important trait of Quick Ben, which is what makes me makes him my favorite character, is that much like John Constantine, we constantly see him go up against enemies who are way, way stronger than him. Enemies who could crush him like an insect, but he still manages to hold his own and out with them. I just love that. The major difference, I guess, between the John Constantine Quick Ben characters is that Alan Moore and Garth Ennis give Constantine a kind of sense of fatalism and self-destruction where that's a recurring theme whenever you read the Hellblazer comic books. Whereas with Quick Ben, Erickson takes a completely different route, which is he goes with mystery and enigma, right? Uh, and that's the other thing we'll try to unpack here. There are two types of people in the world, people with enigma in their lives and people whose entire lives are an enigma. Quick Ben belongs to the latter category. And throughout the books, he is just freaking people out. It's not just us as readers who get sucked into the sense of mystery, this quick Ben vortex. Even the characters in the books do that. People constantly go, dude, who the fuck are you? Who, how do you know this, right? Even really, really powerful mages, ancient beings, elder gods, they always constantly go, who are you? And he pretends not to like it, but he does. Deep down inside, he does. He loves being the man of mystery. And he's always doing things which confirm that persona to the people around him. And as we follow him more and more, we see that there's a certain ego and pride behind it as well. There are some mysterious characters in fiction who are mysterious to the people around them. But to us readers, they're quite clear because we see their internal thinking and monologues and stuff like that. Conversely, there are some mysterious characters who are mysterious to us as the readers, but they're quite plain to the people around them because the characters around them exist in the same fictional universe. This guy is an extreme on both ends. Not only are we as the readers constantly wondering who he is, so is everyone else. So are the other characters who inhabit this fictional universe with him, including his own friends. Even his close confidants are often like, yeah, we don't know much about you. We have no idea what your deal is. This sense of mystery allows Erickson to use Quick Ben as a device for many different things. Firstly, Quick Ben is a key to, or I wouldn't say the debate between hard magic and soft magic, but the kind of dynamic between it. I'm not going to rehash the whole hard magic versus soft magic thing here. The point is that I don't think you can have a quick bend type character with a hard magic system. Or rather you can, but it would just suck the life out of the character. If we had a hard magic system where every time quick bend did something, we would need sort of pages of exposition to fit what he was doing within an established system of framework. That would just ruin things, right? Because he's always pulling a rabbit out of the hat. That's his style. And it simply wouldn't be as entertaining if it had to fit into a fixed structure. This, of course, doesn't mean that he just solves his problems by waving a magic wand and lo and behold, the, the, the problem's over. No, Erickson never abuses that with Quick Ben. There's always a lot of intelligence in his schemes. And almost always we appreciate his quick thinking and the knowledge required to do what he does. And this leads us to another interesting role that uh, Quick Ben plays in the series, 
which is always keeping us off balance in terms of how the power levels work. So I'm a big fan of power levels, hypothetical discussions about who would win if character X and character Y were to fight or who's more powerful than whom, right? I just like stuff like that. It's it's probably the anime and comic book fan in me which draws me to that. Quick bend can often be a huge variable in this equation precisely because the style of fighting is outwitting enemies and not overpowering them. So if he's present on a battlefield, then conventional strength doesn't really matter because he specializes in beating people stronger than him and he specializes in sort of in, in cheating. So a character like Quick Ben would not be as enjoyable in a series where there were fixed power levels either because that's not what he's about. I don't want to use the John Constantine comparison too much but I don't want to discuss too many of Quick Ben's actual story in this video either because I want us to encounter and unpack that, dissect that as we proceed on this journey. So I just want to give you a quick uh, John Constantine parallel for me to get my point across about this power level and outwitting stronger enemies things, right? One of the most famous John Constantine stories involves him going up against one of the most powerful entities in the universe. And John defeats this creature with nothing but beer. Beer? Yes. So the, the, the creature in question in that story is Satan, right? John comes face to face with Satan. And just as it looks like Satan's about to win the day, John convinces him to have a toast with a mere mortal, with a beer. And Satan drinks it, knowing that no poison or venom or whatever would, uh, would work on him anyway. I mean, he's Satan. Come on. And then, after they've had the toast, Constantine reveals that it was actually holy water that was used to create the beer. And with a simple spell that even a amateur mage in the DC Comics universe can make, John turns the beer back into holy water while it's still in Satan's stomach. Uh, Satan screams in pain and escapes. So, even though Satan is conventionally much stronger than John Constantine, John still wins, right? Because it's not about the power level. It's all about the way in which these mages approach their tasks. It's stories like this that we can expect from Quick Ben. He is at his best when he's doing this kind of David and Goliath deal where there's a massive power gap and yet he keeps figuring out ways in which his, no his magical knowledge and his quick thinking can sort of uh, work, their, uh, work their magic, so to speak, no pun intended. And this makes the calculation of power levels in the series a near impossible task, right? Because simply being more powerful doesn't mean you would win in a fight. There are moments where ordinary mortals seem capable of killing Quick Ben, where Quick Ben is scared that ordinary mortals might end his life and there are moments conversely where even the gods are like oh shit we need quick ben quick ben please save us right quick ben's the only one who can save us from this so there's always that nice little dichotomy that comes along because of the soft magic system and because of the way quick ben uses his magic not in a i'm going to blast thousands of thousands of soldiers away type brute force stuff but much more about an, an intellectual and cunning application of magic. So he is an action hero without really being an action hero. Unlike some of the other characters in the series, especially some of the, let's say, the swordsmen, right? Like Anamanda Ray, Kakasa, who get all kinds of cool badass scenes where they take on a large group of enemies by themselves and just wreck them like the Steven Seagal or something. Even the way Quick Ben is introduced into the story is both mysterious and subtle, as we'll see in the next lecture when we start covering that. If you look at the scene where he enters the story, that scene is not about him at all. That scene is much more about Tattersail and Whiskey Jack with Quick Ben and Kalam there to add more mystery. Right? So this is not to say that he can't do the 
all out Hollywood badass type shit. Yes, he can, and he does do his fair share of blasting armies to smithereens. But that's never really when the character is at his best. The character's peak uh, is always when he's doing the sneaky and cunning stuff. So I don't want to give away too much, guys. I wanted to lay a general foundation in terms of how I see the character. In the next lecture, where the real fun starts, we will look at quick bend scenes in Gardens of the Moon in chronological order. Some of the books might require multiple videos since he plays a very important role in them because in some books he's constantly present in most of the subplots. And with some books we can just lump them all together because in some books he doesn't really have a major role to play at all, right? The ultimate aim of this is not just for you to be a Ruthen Bad certified quick Ben expert, even though that's important as well. The ultimate aim is so that we can break down the character mutually. We can break down the quick Ben character as a community. If I miss anything out, you guys can point it out in the comment section. If my interpretation is something that you don't agree with, you can offer your own. The whole point of a lecture series is that you get to respond to the lectures and we get to modify the syllabus together, right, accordingly. So that's it, guys. Those are my spoiler-free thoughts on the character and how I'd like to conduct this series. I hope you join me on this journey and get certified since the world clearly needs more quick bend experts. I'm all about helping people, as you know. I'm all about the compassion and empathy and all that. So this is my way of giving back uh, to the community by getting all of you certified. Don't forget to sign up for the course, guys. Uh, the registration process is so simple that there is no registration process. There's no examination process either. As long as you and I both live long enough for me to complete this series, you will be certified. So that's the end of the lecture, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope I see you all for the next lecture, which starts with uh, Gardens of the Moon. So sign up. Take care. Thank you. I'll see you soon.